uh, my next guest is uh, somebody that uh, you probably won't recognize his face, but uh, you will know his voice. One of the most uh, famous voices on TV. He's got a brand new book out called Voice Over Man, and I'm pleased to say Peter Dixon joins us now on the line. Peter, how are you, sir? I'm very well indeed, Robin. Thank you very much for having me on. So, Peter, after a career like yours of over uh, 45 years, I suppose a book just had to happen. Was it a great uh, process, uh, writing the book? It was a great... Well, it wasn't a great process. It was a tortuous and painful process because I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a naturally fast writer. And uh, for many years, friends and family have been urging me to write my stories down because, you know, I've worked for 43 years in the entertainment world. And, of course by the very fact that I work in it, I come close to and, and work alongside many household names and on big household shows. So I've got a ton of anecdotes and stories that I've been telling friends for years and dining out on. And they've always said, oh, you should write these down in a book. And I said, yes, of course I should. I just couldn't find the time. And um, I, I did start, start, stop process over about four years. It was ridiculous. Uh, and uh, when lockdown happened in March this year, and we were all locked away for God knows how long, I decided now or never. I sat down and I r finished what I'd written already, polished it, and then wrote the remaining six or seven chapters of the book, and then spent uh, another three, four weeks just polishing it and going across it again. And finally got to the point where I thought I was going to publish, and then of course the publishing process is a whole new thing to me as well. So that was tortuous, and and then uh, finding the images to go along with every story, that was a lot of lot of detailed research required for that. So uh, at the end of the day, it, it's done now, and I'm, I think it's most probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. But here it is in my studio now. I've got it here, um, and my son did the artwork for it, which I'm so pleased about. He's a graphic designer, and he's done a terrific job on on not just the you know the cover but he's also done um you know, the interior of the book little things that, oh, that are, are quite kind of quite nice for people in radio to yeah. see because you know he's made it a very very personal book for me and it's made it look and feel wonderful so i couldn't be happier so right now uh, you're sitting in your little studio how many hours a day would you spend locked in your little box oh far too many <laughs> people complain about isolation but i'm quite used to it <laughs> I've been isolated for years, uh, self-isolating, um, because by the very nature of what I do, I mean, I have to be in a, in a soundproof, isolated room. Yeah. And so this is what I call my bunker. This is my con command and control, control center, where everything comes from, including X Factor and all the big shows I've done, were done on these microphones that you, you, you can see around me, or you can just see one at the moment, but there's many. Um, and um, I, uh, so I spend... Um, most of my day in here between, I'd say, you know, 8.30 in the morning till sometimes 7, 8 o'clock at night. So wow. it can be 12 hour, hour days, not all, all in here. Of course, I, I have breaks, but yeah. yeah, this is where I spend a lot of my time. And when I'm not here, I'm, I'm in London doing, uh, working in the bigger studios, not at the moment, obviously, with, uh, with the way things are. But, you know, in normal times, I'd be up in London maybe three days a week uh, for an afternoon or morning sessions in London. So, yeah, I... You're right. I spend most of my time in a padded cell where they can't hear me scream. <laughs> so let's take you back to uh, the start of your career. It all started here in Belfast, didn't it? It did indeed. Uh, Robin, no fraud. I did indeed. It started in BBC Northern Ireland at Radio Ulster where I first started my career. In fact, I started my uh, love of radio. Uh, well, actually doing it at the, at the, uh, uh, in hospital radio, at the Royal Victoria Hospital. And then from there, I went to Queen's University, did a degree. And while I was at Queen's doing my degree, I got involved in the Film Society. A guy there was a BBC cameraman, was helping us out. Long story short, I actually got my foot in the door at BBC uh, uh, reading the news, actually reading the fat stock prices on Radio Ulster. And it seemed so glamorous back then to read the fat stock prices. You know, the, who knew that the price of hoggets and steers could be so fascinating? Uh, and I thought I'd made it. I thought I walked down Royal Avenue after that very first broadcast at 7.30 in the morning. It would have been probably a broadcast that only, you know, uh, ruddy-cheeked, uh, fat-fingered farmers in Tyrone were listening to. But nonetheless, I, would, I was on the air, and I felt like I'd made it. <laughs> and uh, little did I know that I'd only just begun. Um, and little did I know then where my career would take me either. It was, it's been an extraordinary 43 years. 
Now, you also became uh, the youngest ever newsreader at uh, the age of 17, didn't you? I know. I think I still hold the record. Um, I bluffed my way into the BBC. As I said, this started, this whole process started my introduction to the BBC just as I was about to go to university. So I just, I was still in school, uh, barely out of short trousers. <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, I applied and uh, I got an interview, much to my amazement. And uh, the guy that interviewed me, a guy called Michael Bagley, who was the head of the radio presentation, or in fact, the whole presentation department of the BBC, um, asked me what I did, and I lied slightly. I said, I'm, I'm a student. Um, he didn't know what age I was. This was. These were the days before human resources departments would check these things out. So he gave me a job, uh, you know, doing uh, the, I think it was the first job I did was reading the, uh, as I say, the fat stock prices and, the, and reading the news that closed down because the BBC closed down in those days. Can you imagine? <laughs> um, and uh, I did a lot of that stuff. Um, so that was that was fantastic during university it paid for my university education my parents didn't have to pay for for anything and i i supported myself and have done ever since but um yeah 17 years old what a brass neck to walk in through the doors of broadcasting house and demand a job what what, <laughs> what, what a neck and of course it must have been fairly <laughs> tough in those days as well this would have been during the dark days of the troubles here wouldn't it it was, and I love the way that the Troubles are just sort of described as the Troubles. It sounds so kind of fluffy and, uh, and anodyne, but in fact, you're right, Robin. It was probably, uh, well, this would have been, now let me think, um, the late 70s, early 80s, and all through the 80s, actually, because um, I left Belfast in 82 to go to London. But yeah, during the early 80s, it was, uh, it was a dark period, a very dark period. And I, I'd also flirted with journalism during that time. I was a a very bad journalist, probably the world's worst journalist ever. Um, but I was surrounded by these wonderful um, uh, reporters. Like they were starting out on their careers. People like Nick Witchell and Kate Aidy and Jeremy Paxman all came through the BBC Belfast newsroom because it was the focus of attention for much of the world's media at that time. And so, you know, I, I, I should have and could have learned from the best or who would, would turn out to be the best. They were no doubt stars in the making. But journalism wasn't for me. I couldn't sniff out a story to save my life. And I, um, I decided that I would, my, my, my future lay in, in voice work, in voiceovers and in radio presentation and, and being a DJ, perhaps. I didn't know what I was going to do. And you also actually broke the news about uh, the murder of uh, Lord Mountbatten, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was on duty that day in the BBC newsroom, um, and uh, the news came in on the on the press association wires that there'd been an explosion in uh, down in the in the Republic, and um, and, uh, and the, the the initial report was that Lord Mountbatten had been injured. Um, we delayed the, uh, the the reporting of the story because it's such a it was a still is uh, you know it had, there were global shockwaves from that event. Here, here was the you know the Queen's uh, uh, cousin, I think he is, uh, the Viceroy of India, previous Viceroy of India, massive, massively important figure in, in all respects, uh, uh, seemingly uh, had lost his life. But we, we waited and waited until we had confirmation from the, uh, from the Garda, and we, that confirmation came through. Sadly, it was the case that he had indeed been killed, and uh, we were straight to air with it. Um, yeah, it was a day I'll never forget. And, and of course, that was also the day when there was another tragedy uh, down in, um, in just near the border as well with the parachute regiment losing 16 soldiers that day. So it was a dark, dark day. And, uh, and I think those two incidents um, and many more where I'd interviewed just too many widows, you know, uh, policemen's widows. And I just thought this wasn't uh, the career for me. I just had, threw in the towel and thought, no, I can't do this anymore. So then you went to London. I always remember you being involved with uh, Steve Wright at the time on uh, Radio 1. Yes, that was a really fun time for me. I, the BBC is, is a great institution, and uh, there used to be a canteen on the top floor, on the seventh floor of Broadcasting House in London, where everybody would simply congregate at lunchtime, and you'd end up in, the, in a lunch queue next to Robin Day or, you know, uh, Esther Ranson. And one day I ended up next to Steve Wright, and we got chatting as our trays were moving along the canteen queue. And, and we, I joined him for lunch, and we, we, get, we got on like, like a supermarket on fire. <laughs> and so I was so delighted to meet him because I'd always admired him from afar. 
anyway, that, that afternoon meeting, that lunch meeting ended with, with us agreeing, God knows how, but I said, well, let, let me, I'd love to do some character voices on your show. I'd never done a character voice in my life, but we, we ended up creating this character and, um, and uh, I did it on his radio show for many years. And uh, that then uh, led to other character voices on his show uh, and phoning in, phone in characters. And I suddenly realized or slowly realized that I had a, a passion for this kind of work and I enjoyed it. So, um, and then I thought maybe I could make a career out of doing this, uh, being a voice actor rather than just a, a DJ or a newsreader. I could do other things. And that's how it, how it started. So then television came along, and uh, before The X Factor, you did uh, TV game shows like uh, Family Fortunes, and even The Price is Right with uh, Bruce Forsyth, didn't you? I did. That was, uh, that was one of the most fun shows to work on, actually, because working up close with a, a showbiz legend like Brucey was just a treat, a real one-off opportunity, which I was so pleased to have been able to have had. Uh, and watching him work was was a real lesson. I know he. I've never met anybody before or since who could literally walk onto a studio floor in front of a live audience and have them eating out of his hand within about two seconds. He just knew audiences. He knew people. He knew what they wanted. And he, he was a great sense of timing. And I remember watching him many times in the in the wings in the studio in the darkness in the Stygian gloom backstage, just before he walked out into the bright spotlight. And he would stand there rocking backwards and forwards on his finely polished patent leather shoes and he would he would be listening with his eyes his head slightly cocked forward and backwards and listening to the audience and sort of sizing them up like they were his rightful prey you know and uh he would just go into this zone where he would just listen and think and listen and think and then as soon as his name was called out or he's introduced onto the floor he would just come out give a little skip and come out with his hands, his palms wide open like that. And the eyes were darting about and twinkling and he had that smile. And the audience just, they relaxed. They knew they were in the ha- hands of someone who was going to entertain them. They didn't have to worry about anything. He, was, he just took them over and took them with him. He was, he was extraordinary to watch. And that show was great too because of the, the huge pantomime-like um, fairground style sets and prizes. I remember I used to, pray for uh, the end of the show for <laughs> but we all used to pray for like a really someone who really was so inappropriate to win all this stuff because they'd win some really amazing prizes and one time it did happen uh, this um, little old lady who lives on the 17th floor of a tower block in leeds she won uh, you know a, 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 a huge speedboat <laughs> a sauna a seven berth caravan 50 grand in cash you know car it was just amazing and uh, <clears throat> her face her face was a picture i loved that show let's talk about x factor uh, was it uh, simon cowell that chose you as the voice of the x factor I don't know. I don't think so. He probably would have had a hand in it. I auditioned with a lot of other people, I guess. Uh, I, I saw the pilot show because the guy that put, told me about it was this sound engineer on a show I'd done with Philip Schofield and Anne Robinson called Test the Nation for the BBC. And he said, they're having trouble finding somebody who can do the voice for this new show. It's got the working title, The X Factor. Nobody had ever heard of it. Uh, and uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll have, a look at the, the, uh, have a look at the pilot. He sent me a copy of the pilot show. And as soon as I saw that, I knew I was the guy that was going to make a difference. I, could, I knew I could do it because uh, I knew it was a big, bra- it needed something big. And um, so I sent in my audition and, uh, and a few days later I got the call that I got the gig. So um, that was, again, something that uh, was an amazing show to be involved in. Yes, it, was, it, was, it became um, a behemoth. It, beca- it, was glo- it went global. You know, it was the biggest show on TV with regular, well, at its peak, was attracting 18, 20 million people watching it. Um, extraordinary. So what about uh, your voice? Uh, do you do regular exercises uh, to keep the voice sounding so good? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, you know, I think the only thing people say to me, you know, what, how do you look after your voice? I think uh, the thing that I found that works best is just hydration. If you, if you drink enough water, that is the oil in your vocal engine. It's, uh, it goes into your system. It gets to your vocal cords eventually, and uh, it um, keeps them nice and plump. Uh, if you become dehydrated, those vocal folds can, you know, not to get too technical about it, but they can deflate and, 
and it can become dry and raspy, and that's where you get vocal problems. Things called vocal nodes can form, and that's pretty painful. And the only way you can get rid of those is by surgery, and that's, uh, that means, obviously, you're going to be out of work for many months. So um, drinking, keeping hydrated is good, and keeping your, um, you know, before you work, warming up your voice is important. You know, not only the vocal folds, but the muscles of articulation, the tongue, the lips, the jaw, etc., making sure those muscles are working so your diction is good. And um, so there's not, not a lot else you can do. I mean, I wish I could say I have this magic potion that I found in the Amazonian rainforest, but I haven't got anything like that. <laughs> and do you have your voice insured? I do, yeah. Because it's the only thing that stands between me and complete abject poverty, I'm afraid. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that... Um, when you think about it, it's quite terrifying. And these two small uh, folds of mucous membrane are the only things that keep me and my family from the breadline. Um, and so I am, um, you know, I, I do insure, insure it for quite a lot. And uh, touch wood, I've never had to call on it, but it's nice to know it's there. I'm, I'm virtually unemployable in, in any other capacity. <laughs> now, what about uh, plans for Christmas this year? Is it going to be a nice family Christmas? Uh, no, it's not going to be a nice family Christmas. Normally, I go to Belfast. I come over to Belfast. I've got family over there, and we visit them, stay with them. And uh, my, my sister lives there, and my, my wife's mother and uh, her family and, and her brother. But this year, you know, for obvious reasons, we're, we're staying put here in London, and uh, we're going to have to, you know, just uh, stay here. My son lives over here, so he's going to join us. Um, and that's about it. I'm actually quite looking forward to staying at home for a change. Yeah. It'll make a change from uh, traveling at this time of year. It can be quite difficult, you know, when, particularly when there's snow on the ground and it's cold. But, um, but we'll, we'll keep in touch on Zoom like everybody else. So, Peter, it's been great talking to you. The book uh, Voice Over Man is out now. Where can we get our hands on it? You can um, order it any way you like. I mean, if you want to go on Amazon, it's right it's on there right now. Uh, all formats. We've got the audio book. I read the audio book, by the way, which was interesting. Uh, it's available on Kindle, paperback and hardback uh, on the Amazon bookstore. Um, Waterstones have it. Uh, you know, this, it's everywhere. You can, you can get it anywhere. Anywhere you, you can buy any books, you'll find it there. Great. Well, Peter, thank you so much uh, for joining us on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Robin. It's been a great pleasure and happy Christmas to you and all your viewers. So